Nazis getting up to some no-good occult tomfoolery has been a part of mainstream entertainment for as far back as we can remember. Indiana Jones, The Twilight Zone, Hellboy, even shows as recent as Amazon's hunters have squeezed every possible conspiracy theory and real-life info about Hitler's fallen regime that is out there in order to craft stories that have become iconic. But the most iconic of the bunch, at least in our opinion, is Koda Hirano's Helsing, because it shows you those heinous war criminals in the the exact light that you imagine them to be bathed in, blood red and downright destructive. If you guys have only seen the first Helsing anime that came out in 2001, you might not know what we're talking about, because the only hint regarding the existence of Nazis in that story came to you through the design of a chip. That is why we're here to talk about the real antagonists of the Helsing franchise, the remnants of the so-called Thousand Year Reich, Millennium, an organization that has built itself in the shadows for half a century, Millennium was able to reduce the city of London to ash and rubble in the course of a single night. And we're going to break down how they did that and everything else as well. This is Millennium's Origins Explored. But first, a history lesson. Did the Nazis actually use occultism in their military campaigns during World War II? The sheer scale of the horrific actions of Hitler's racist regime were so humongous that people were naturally worried about Nazis showing up in their backyards in the aftermath of World War II. They were also naturally curious about just what drove them to the insane lengths that they went to in their persecution of the Jews. And those two things usually form the converging point for epic revelations in many adaptations of the Third Reich. Indiana Jones turns Nazis into biblical artifact hunters and pursuers of alien technology. Captain America gives that role to Hydra, the research division of the Nazi regime, which eventually gets tangled up in Avengers affairs thanks to Red Skull's obsession with Steve Rogers. Amazon's Hunters blurs the line between reality and conspiracy by confirming that Hitler was still alive in Argentina and had even had children with Ava Braun, who survived as well, apparently. Why do these movies and shows come up with such wacky premises in the first place? Well, that's because of the tinge of reality that comes attached to these premises that grants them the dubious authenticity of what if -ism. The premise of Hunters is that Nazis that escaped the fall of Germany have now invaded South America and the USA at levels that were thought to be unprecedented before. Well, Nazis in South America have a well-documented history of sequestered living and causing societal unrest in nations like Argentina, Chile, and Brazil. So confirming conspiracy theories about Hitler faking his own death and escaping with his men becomes an epic shock reveal for the season 2 finale of Hunters. Operation Paperclip is treated like a terrible secret in Hunters, but pretty much every character we know and care about from Marvel is aware of it these days. The fact that the United States hired former Nazi scientists to reach the moon was what allowed Arnim Zola to continue existing into the Winter Soldier days of the MCU, and the word we really want to stress here is fact. It is a fact that the USA did did indeed recruit former Nazi scientists for their own technological advancement in the latter half of the 20th century. It is fact that many high-ranking Nazi officials fled to South America in the wake of Hitler's demise, as evidenced by the rat lines that were built by former Argentine president Juan Perón, an ardent fascist and Nazi sympathizer. You need only Google the names Adolf Eichmann and Joseph Mengele to understand that the threat these shows try to sell you on, Nazis and their diabolical ideology, is very real. There's a reason we said Hunters blurs the lines between reality and conspiracy, as you can now tell. Where things get more fictitious is when we start moving towards Nazi occultism, because while there is evidence of Nazis dabbling in the occult, there is no concrete evidence of the party itself espousing occult ideals. There was no official occult doctrine or any kind of special executive order given to create a paranormal division or anything like that. It was actually the individual officers of the party whose lives and interactions give rise to this notion that the Nazis were using paranormal means to fight during World War II. Several high-ranking officials like Rudolf Hess and Heinrich Himmler were associated with the esoteric Thule Society. To put it simply, Thule Society members believed that all Germanic peoples had originated from the mythical island of Thule, and this gave them racial superiority over all other peoples. This ideology is called Ariosophy, and it served as the precursor for the Nazi party's racial ideals following their rapid rise to power. Himmler took things a bit further 
together by having SS uniforms emblazoned with Nordic runes, and Goebbels used the rising tide of a return to Germany's pre-Christian heritage to hammer home many esoteric tidings regarding the fatherland's prosperous future to be. Goebbels especially incorporated Nostradamus' ideology into his propagandas, especially towards the end of the Second World War, and there was a weird shift in Nazi military focus at the time towards developing ballistic rockets, as opposed to things like the atomic bomb, which ultimately allowed the Allies to win the war. And this is perhaps the only place where we can say occultism actually took place. Hitler never personally believed in any of the religious high ideals he would spout during his unhinged sermons, but he did recognize the efficacy of such words on his people, and at some point, he allowed those words to take a hold of himself, especially when his mind was weakened by paranoia and a reportedly massive amount of drugs. It's possible that he believed that Germany needed some kind of biblical weapon to win the war, because he ultimately shifted weapons production priority towards producing the V2, which ended up in disaster for the Nazis. Albert Speer claimed as much in his testimonies about his time as a Nazi and as a close aide to Hitler, but given his affiliations, anything he says is dubious at best and a straight-up lie at worst. But one thing is clear from everything you can read and watch about the Nazi party during the Second World War. Occultism was becoming a part of their overall messaging. Under the Nazi regime, border science became more commonly accepted than actual science, and things like blood packs were not uncommon. Himmler himself had a personal occultist in Karl Maria Willigut, who claimed that Vivelsburg Castle would become the center of the world, that he himself was the last in a long line of mystic teachers, dating back to Christ's day and age, and that the runic symbols he designed for the SS and presumably other divisions under Himmler's eye granted their wearers sacred protection from their allied enemies. Tales of Slavic, blood-sucking vampires coming to invade Germany and proud, homegrown werewolves rising up to defend the fatherland against them became far more commonplace than you'd imagine. And Hitler himself promoted the frankly asinine world ice theory that claimed that ice was the cosmic essence of all creation, and that he realized this in a vision he had in 1894 as a proud Aryan origin theory. Considering the fact that most of these people were mixing more than sugar with their afternoon tea, so to speak, it isn't outrageous to think that Nazis would end up getting this bafflingly tangled with occultism at a time where discipline might have led them to their terrifying original goal, the establishment of a thousand-year Reich. Because ultimately, when seen with the cold lens of logic, it wasn't esoteric power or hidden alien tech that allowed the Allies to defeat their enemies in World War II. It was the hard work put in by the ground forces, their hundreds of supporting allies, and their thousands of fallen comrades. It's fun to think that the Nazis were a bunch of rabble-rousers and that Hitler bewitched his people with the Spear of Destiny that he somehow procured despite denouncing the church officially, but when you see things with a lens of passive objectivity, you see the flaws in his plans almost instantly. He should have just been ruthless and decisive with his plans instead of trying to outflank the Soviet Union with lightly armored troops that had to weather the dreaded Russian winters with the power of dysfunctional runes. Or he could have had a guy like the Major on his side, who actually possessed the insane instinct to make everything we've just spent five minutes ridiculing a terrifying reality. They were created by Hitler's Special Order 666, which authorized research into any and all means of defeating the Allies. And we do mean any and all. Kota Hirano's Helsing is often discussed for its gloriously gory scenes, but not enough for incorporating some rather realistic and disturbing symbolism and imagery into the narrative itself. Today, we know that the Nazi party was about as close to actual devils in human skin that you could probably get, but if we were to transport you through time to a moment where the Nazis' terrible secrets had not yet been exposed, you'd be terrified at just how many people actually came out in support of them. There were many things that made Hitler's party such a bafflingly successful political and military military force, not the least of which was the charisma of the Nazi party officers. If you've ever seen a Hitler speech out of sheer morbid curiosity, you'd have noticed the uncannily appeasing oratory speaking pattern of the worst world leader in human history. That can also be said of his top-ranking officers, because Nazi Germany was a state that functioned off of propaganda, so being a good public speaker was kind of a necessity for the job. Why are we talking about the great speaking skills of mass murderers and war criminals in a video about vampires and werewolves? Well, it's because those speeches are relevant to the topic at hand. 
Hirano seems to have drawn inspiration from two key addresses in the creation of his major villains for the series. The second one is more of an adaptation, and we'll get to it later on in the video, so let's address the first for now. The first is a speech that Hitler delivered in 1941 to the Nazi party in Munich, where he touches upon the Third Reich overtly and multiple times, drawing the thousand-year analogy that he had made so synonymous with his tyrannical regime. In the speech itself, Hitler claims that Germany's history stretches back at least a couple thousand years and can be quantified into two distinct phases. The First Reich was the Holy Roman Empire, which gave way to the Second Reich, which was the German Empire that fought and lost in the First World War. After suffering through the excesses of Bolshevism and Western-style democracy, Hitler had galvanized the German population with his unique, flamboyant style of leadership and the promise of true National Socialism. His party's victory, in his mind, ushered in the era of the Third Reich, which would go on to rule with a golden hand over the peoples of the world for another thousand years. This pipe dream of establishing a thousand-year Reich is what seems to have inspired Millennium's name, but also their purpose as well. Hitler ended that incendiary address to his party members in Munich by claiming that he knows that when the command is given, forward march, Germany would rise up as a whole and fulfill their duty as one nation being guided by providence. The point of the speech was to try and mobilize the spirits of the German peoples into becoming an endless war machine that could liberate the Germanic peoples across Europe and take their rightful position at the top of the food chain. Hirano took that premise, removed the racism from it, and made it Millennium's purpose as well. The occult organization was established by Hitler's Special Order 666 in an effort to find an absolute way to crush the Allies once and for all. The Fuhrer commissioned his occult research division to devise new ways of waging war on the Allies, and doing it in such a manner that it ensured Germany's absolute victory no matter the cost. He assigned the Doctor, Hirano's version of the infamous Angel of Death, Joseph Mengele, to work with a team of men just as curious and depraved as him and create undying soldiers for the Thousand Year Reich. To oversee this team of literal mad scientists, he put his maddest dog in charge of them, and this is where the ending of the last section becomes relevant to our video. Before he became renowned as the iconic major, Helsing's main antagonist was a first lieutenant in Heinrich Himmler's brutal SS forces. He was not an accomplished soldier by any means, as he couldn't defend himself in a fistfight and couldn't even land a shot at point-blank range. But what he lacked in physical abilities, he more than made up for with his feverish charisma and his single-minded obsession with warfare. The Fuhrer must have liked this about the guy because he raised the lieutenant to the post of a major and gave him free reign to come up with Germany's supernatural line of defense as long as it was done post-haste. Millennium established its first research divisions in Nazi-occupied Poland, especially in the capital city of Warsaw, where they took Poles, Soviets, Jews, and anyone else they could get their hands on for some non-consensual human experimentation. The Major sent out a task force to the Germany-allied region of Northern Transylvania, who were given the unenviable task of entering the village of Bran in Brasov County in order to procure Subject Zero for their occult army. If you guys have read Bram Stoker's Dracula, you know where we're going with this, but if you haven't, to put it simply, Bran Castle is the site of Dracula's castle from that iconic novel, and Subject Zero was buried on its grounds. She had technically been dead for over half a century at least, but that technicality was dubious at best, because Mina Harker, the unfortunate damsel in distress of Stoker's masterpiece, had somehow managed to survive being killed and buried in the ground at least in the most primal sense of the term, survival. She might be nothing more than a shriveled up zombie corpse, but her cells held the key to eternity, and that's what Millennium truly wanted. Mina Harker's body was transported to Warsaw, where the doctor used her cells to experiment on the aforementioned ethnic groups and create a massive army of Nazi control old ghouls. In theory, the idea was flawless. A self-replenishing army that could get back up and keep fighting even when attacked by a hail of bullets if they missed the heart in the head. But in practice, it was going to take even a genius like the doctor several decades to perfect the ghoulification process. By 1944, Millennium had only just begun being able to sustain a subject's lifespan beyond the cell injection stage. And though Hitler was issuing orders to speed up the production at once, the Major had other ideas. He knew exactly what power the essence of Mina Harker's immortality, and he was aware that in order to take down him, an army of ghouls wasn't going to be enough. If Germany was to win the war, it would eventually have to fight the British one way or another, and that would mean getting tangled with the Helsing organization and their best cleaner by far. Millennium had been coasting through with their research for a few years by the time 1944 rolled around, and it had not gone unnoticed by Helsing, who dispatched Alucard and a young Walter C. Dornes to destroy the occult division 
second before it ever got its feet off the ground. Walter, who was really young at the time, attacked the Major and the Doctor by himself and was forced to admit that he needed backup. The Major also jerked him around by claiming he should join Millennium instead of working with a monster like Alucard, but Walter just pressed on with his fight against the werewolf captain, whilst Alucard proceeded to toy with Rip Van Winkle and give her PTSD that she carried with her into the main series. Helsing's top two operatives were able to destroy most Millennium research facilities in Warsaw, but they didn't manage to capture any of the top brass or secure Mina Harker's body itself. The Major, the Doctor, and the rest of Millennium fled to Germany, where they most likely participated in the final stand of Berlin. The Major was severely injured during this last gasp of a defensive operation, and the Doctor had to turn him into a cyborg to ensure his survival. Millennium's top brass then escaped to South America, presumably using the rat lines we mentioned before, and began biding their time for a re-emergence of the Third Reich a la Hunters. However, instead of infiltrating governments in military outfits all across the globe, Piranos escaped Nazis took a more, shall we say, overt approach to world dominance. And this is where the second speech from a Nazi party official comes into play. Elite werewolves, 1,000 SS vampires, a literal Schrodinger's cat, and total non-stop warfare. Millennium's goal in Helsing Ultimate. After his first encounter with Alucard in the 1940s, the Major became obsessed with the vampire. He spent the next 50 years in South America developing contacts as the Doctor perfected the process of artificial vampirization. In the first Helsing anime released in 2001, this was done via Freak Chips, a digital implant that artificially turns humans into vampires and doesn't stop working even after being removed. Millennium as a whole is pretty much missing from Helsing 2001, as the only hints to its existence in that anime are the design of the freak chips, which have a swastika in the middle of them, and the fact that the Valentine brothers, one of the only manga villains to actually be in both adaptations of Helsing, talk about Britz's unit, which can only be a reference to the first lieutenant and Millennium's strongest vampire, Zorin Blitz. In the manga and the OVA series, things play out very differently from Helsing 2001. Between 1944 and 1999, Millennium is able to perfect the creation of supernatural beasts from European folklore, as well as that literal Schrodinger's cat we spoke of earlier in the video. Despite other wings of the Nazi party like the Wehrmacht and the Heer also surviving the fall of the Third Reich alongside the Major, once Millennium's preparations were completed, those officials became irrelevant. The Major called every surviving senior official of the Nazi party and took over leadership of whatever was left as the de facto leader of the Millennium Organization. He had a standing army of around 1,000 artificial vampire ghouls who had been given SS training in their human lives, making them inhumanly efficient killers, pun very much intended. All of his major lieutenants and captains were either overpowered obedient vampires or mighty werewolves plucked out of history for another glorious stand for the Germanic peoples. They also had a nigh-omniscient catboy warrant officer that could phase in and out of reality whilst breaking the fourth wall, but breaking reality isn't as cool as fangs and fur, now is it? His army was outfitted with Nazi-era weaponry like Car 98s, MP40s, Panzerfausts, stick grenades, and the like, but everything was upgraded to keep up with modern-era rapid-fire assault rifles. The Letzti Battalion formed up in secret in the jungles of South America before launching a sneak attack on Helsing Manor in 1999. The brothers Luke and Jan Valentine, a pair of particularly nasty and sadistic artificial vampires led a full frontal assault on the heart of Britain's occult line of defense, and though they didn't manage to kill their top targets, Alucard and Integra, they accomplished their goal of decimating Helsing's ranks and giving its leader PTSD by turning the victims into ghouls loyal to Millennium. The Helsing organization was left with less than 10 soldiers, where it had once had 100, but the goal was to provoke Alucard into leaving Britain altogether. Integra Fairbrook Helsing, the director of the Helsing organization, commissioned her trump card to travel to Brazil and attack Millennium at its heart, commanding him to search and destroy. Alucard follows through, but realizes that they've been had all along. This wasn't properly explained in the OVA series, but after Alucard takes out Millennium's local Brazilian lieutenant, Tubalcane Alhambra, the Major stages the coup we mentioned earlier and takes over all remaining Nazi resources in South America. See, the Major's compatriots, well, true Nazis at heart, had petty ambitions. They would simply be content with establishing a 
political Third Reich working through the shadows until one day in the distant future they can show their faces under the sun. The Major was a different kind of guy. He was inspired by the Reich propaganda minister Goebbels' infamous total war speech at the Berlin Sport Palace towards the tail end of World War II, and he decided to make it his life's mantra. Where other hidden Nazi divisions planned a restoration of the glorious regime, the Major sought total, unending, unyielding war, and this is what made Millennium's goal different from what everyone else thought it was going to be. Hitler might have commissioned this organization for the Reich, but the Führer was long dead. The Major had identified Alucard as the new main threat to the existence of all humans, and so he focused all his energy on exterminating this one guy, and anyone else who was associated with him by extension. After luring Alucard away from London by using Rip Van Winkle as bait, Millennium launches an assault on both London and Helsing Manor, with their full strength divided across three zeppelins named after various Nazi leaders that carpet bomb the crap out of the city. The organization manages to reduce the city to blood, ash, and rubble in a single night, and all of Helsing's backup forces, the Wild Geese, are also slain in the attack on the manor. Walter C. Dornes, Integra's right-hand man, the Alfred to her Bruce Wayne, betrays her and joins Millennium, revealing that he had been double-crossing her all along. And, in the end, even Alucard is taken down thanks to the existential dichotomy that is Schrodinger. Millennium pretty much manages to achieve everything that the Major wanted it to achieve in the short term, which is why he dies thinking himself victorious despite having sacrificed literally all of his men in a mad orchestra of death and destruction. But Helsing ends up surviving. Not only that, Alucard returns as well, and the City of London and the world at large have pretty much recovered from that shocking day in 1999 over the 30 years it takes him to gain control of his soul once again. If you compare the amount of planning that went into the assault and the amount of time it took for the world to recover from it and bounce back, you'd think that these guys were a pretty pointless bunch of villains. But really, the whole organization is a one-man show, and that man is the Major. His I Love War speech is one of the best villainous monologues in anime history, and it single-handedly makes Millennium feel like the world-ending threat it was depicted as in Helsing Ultimate. There have been many occult Nazi stories in the world of fiction, and some of them are even great, but perhaps none of them are as iconic as Millennium from Helsing Ultimate. These guys embodied the unhinged sense of terror that the word Nazi tends to inspire in our minds in this day and age, and that's quite an accomplishment considering how saturated that genre has become. Marvelous Verdict But, as for this video, that's gonna have to be it. Millennium is the perfect example of an anime villain group that does evil for evil's sake, because at the end of the day, that's what it boiled down to. They didn't just kill Helsing operatives or Iscariot soldiers who showed up to aid their unlikely Protestant allies on D-Day 2, but then ended up turning on them instead. Millennium destroyed indiscriminately and senselessly, and each person in the organization was crazier than the last. The sheer insanity that fills the ranks of this secret terrorist group is what makes it so great in our opinion. But what do you guys think? Let us know in the comments section down below, and we'll see you guys in the next one.